Uh, screw it, I got, I got the mics. Oh, he's got the mic. So I messed up my whole introduction. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, hey. Yeah, I guess this is the man you actually came to see, so um, <laughs> I might just shut off, sit down, um, get a drink, um, wait for someone to bring us nice little commodities and um, say welcome. Which, um, side, which this, side? Here you want me? I think they cool. want you there, yes. Great. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, as you can tell, the Germanness really comes through in this. Um, it's really well <laughs> rehearsed. Um, yeah, and we like to keep it this way ever since we started this in 1998 already, which kind of dates us, so you should, I hope you're not too good in mathematics. Um, well, you might wonder... 1998? Is that what you said, or 88? 98. That's the same year as pi. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, um, actually our videos look as grainy from then. It's like... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's like... Uh, <clears throat> Um, yeah, and you might wonder what this whole thing is about. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. That is very kind, thanks. Um, well, at the heart of it, it is a traveling workshop where 60 people um, make it past a really grueling process where you have to apply and send them music, and in the end, you get to sit in a room a little smaller than this, because um, there's only 30 of you, and you still get to listen to people sitting on a couch talking about what they would talk about on their own couch at home, uh, which is mostly music and music stuff and how to do music. And it feels a little bit like the Zach between two ferns, doesn't it? <laughs> He's the Zach, for sure. <laughs> well, like, um, I've been can, set up. Yeah. You know? Shall I open the, the shirt to make it more authentic? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry, I don't know. What, what is your best uh, president of the United States impression? I don't, I don't do impressions. Okay, good. Um, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> yes, this thing... Um, in the end, you get there and you hear banter like this all day. In the end, you kind of start to think, like, do I actually want to be in a creative industry? Do I want to be a music producer? or that kind of stuff, where people talk stuff like that all day? Or do I want to go back and get a real job and um, do accounting and um, be a surgeon or something that means something? And um, <laughs> over all those years, um, some people did not choose to go down that path. And some of you might know there's like a kid called Hudson Mohawk. He was actually a participant in this very town in 2007. Um, opened for MIA um, as one of his first bigger gigs. Um, I guess some of you might have heard of him by now. Um, his partner in crime at Tonight, uh, Lunis, who is a fellow Canadian. And um, the good news is he was not only a participant in 2010, but his debut album is finally ready and coming out in the first quarter of next year, in case you ever wondered. And there's a bunch of others, Aloe Black, Nina Kravitz, um, a whole lot of people that um, do really interesting music, and some of them end up in film sooner or later. And um, that is why we figured, hey, it makes actually a lot of sense to talk to the people on the other side of it. Because in um, very selfish fashion, we just want to know from the people we think are kind of good at what they do, how they actually do it, why they do it, and all those good things. And um, yeah. It is called an academy, and sometimes you even get to speak to people who went to Harvard and other places. So I think this is the time when it would be the cue, and I'd say, please join me in welcoming Mr. Darren Aronofsky. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me, and thank you for all showing up and coming out. And. Uh, um, it's probably the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. Well, um, what we usually like to do is um, we play records, because that kind of records that people liked in their childhood, people they like, people they admire for the weirdest reasons, or stuff that was big in their household. And um, seeing that, to my knowledge, you did not produce all too many records, we just went over to film. and. Um, your first choice would be something rather local. You want to introduce it? 
Um, yeah, so uh, I guess it all started, they asked me just to think about um, a bunch of different, uh, different how music and film has uh, interconnected and uh, influenced me over the years. So I, I guess I started um, where it probably all began, which was this, I, I was kind of lucky to grow up in Brooklyn when two major musical forms sort of came and took over the world. And this first clip, which you'll all recognize from the beginning, um, really was the first of the two movements. So we should probably just start with that. It's so easy to forget how good of a movie that is, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's very clear how good the film is, but uh, I think it was way over my head at the time. In fact, it was my first R-rated movie. Um, how the story goes is, you know, I guess I was seven or eight when it came out and stormed the world, and uh, me and my sister were dying to see it, and there was, my dad was not having it, uh, but my mom was like, you know, everyone's seen it, it's all gonna go over their head, and then they took us to the theater to see it, and it was, uh, you know, during the scene in the back seat when there's the blowjob. Am I allowed to curse? You know, my dad's like hitting my mom and just like, it's just like, don't worry, it's over their head. And uh, <clears throat> the next day at breakfast, my mom's, you know, making breakfast, and me and my sister are fighting over what a blowjob is. And uh, we're like, Mom, who's right? Who's right? And my mom's great line was, Patty, listen to your brother. <laughs> but I don't know what that has to do with anything, but, uh, um, uh, but it was interesting because it was the start of disco taking over the world, and that was probably 10, 12 miles from where I grew up. And so it was, um, it was interesting just to uh, be at the birthplace of that. Um, and then, of course, a few years later, also being there when hip-hop started and became even a bigger phenomenon. Um, but I think I chose that one just because it, it, there's no getting around it. It was an incredible seminal thing. And I think as far as a film sequence, technically it does so much from the opening title starting off, you know, just in, in the silence and the natural sounds of, of that, those aerial shots pulling out of Manhattan to geographically completely set you up. Um, and then just establishing the character so quickly uh, from the paint, which becomes the next, you okay? <laughs> the paint swinging, are you? I'm a little worried, that was like, the last time when we showed Requiem for a Dream here, we had a heart attack, so I got, <laughs> I, I, I was saying night fever, it's not so bad, but. Um, well, we're still in the mildly more upbeat territory, so. <laughs> So uh, it, it just establishes the character in so, so many ways and, and just the, ch the incredible charm of, of John Travolta is completely won over to the audience and that type of efficiency uh, is just great, great filmmaking. How different does the film to you seem to you now than apart from the blowjob scene to when you watched it as a kid? Well, I you know, it's, yeah, I complete, you know, the, I don't, has anyone seen it recently? Not really. But the whole, you know, the whole time you're seeing it, you're thinking that the girl he really likes, the, the one who's always talking about moving to Manhattan, is really classy and wants to go into Manhattan, and you kind of miss the whole irony that she's, you know, is totally as Brooklyn as he is. So I think I missed that whole level. Like, I, I didn't realize there was this... Um, it's a very complicated film because it's making fun of the characters in a certain way and then it has incredible pathos like the suicide on the uh, Verrazano Bridge. It's, um, so, th so it's complicated because there's an incredible realism of what these kids are suffering and what their lives are, but also the kind of shallowness and ridiculousness of the way they behave. I guess, you know, that kind of shallowness is, would be the follow-up to Travolta's career, which would be Greece, which is really all that it was. It didn't really have the pathos except for maybe, maybe beauty, beauty school uh, dropout had a little pain in it, but there wasn't that much pain. Um, so I think it was just, a, it's an incredible film and the fact that it really s swept, I, I think there's something about um, the realism with these iconic characters that is, 
you know, been an influence. I think there's something I like about um, mythological characters in very, very normal, real settings. I guess folks here are a little bit closer to New York, but still, um, especially growing up on the other side of the pond, that was one of the movies that really informed our notion of what New York must be like. And um, the light alone, and let's say when 20 years later you read like a Jonathan Leafham Fortress of Solitude, which is sort of set in a similar area. No, it's uh, pretty era. far away. I mean, uh, era, I meant. Era, sorry. era, but so different area, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, era. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then um, you still kind of get that vibe, and then by the time you probably go to New York, you enter it at Giuliani times, and it's yeah. a very different place straight yeah. away. Well, that, I think New York is always about change. And that's one of the great things. I mean, New Yorkers like to constantly complain about how things used to be. Um, there was a, a, a writer I really like, Colson Whitehead, wrote about, um, he wrote this piece after 9-11. That was kind of the first thing I read that sort of helped with the mourning of that, um, which was that, uh, you know, New York is always complaining and people are always talking about how New York used to be and that this is just another event in a chapter in a city that is, eternal in its own way and will keep moving and keep changing. So, you know, people are now complaining about the old New York, but you know, there's a lot of great things about, that continue to be about New York. Well, um, let me put on my Well and Gen X um, voice and say turn the page to another chapter of New York, forward yeah. to 1989, yeah. another number. number yeah, the, another next summer. the next clip is, I kind of chose it because it's another opening of a film. Um, but, and it, and it uses, I guess, music and imagery in a completely different way, but they're definitely related because they're about neighborhoods in Brooklyn once again. So let's roll it. I, it's so interesting because uh, it's also, you forget that there was this fairy tale element to do the right thing as well as this um, total, um, total realism mixed with this fairy tale. Um, it's, 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 I mean, when you look at it, it's hard to believe that was shot in a real location. And when you think about the whole movie, it has this strange feel of somewhere between um, something really happening and, and this kind of magical, realistic setting. So, I don't know, that it was a major, major film when it came out for all of us because New York was in a very different place than it was in 1977. Uh, race relations were uh, really boiling over and Spike completely tapped into the sort of uh, ethos that was just floating around and what was in everyone's head every time you got on a subway, every time you walked down the street. And he just made it a timeless tale. Uh, I knew I had to pick something from Do the Right Thing. I didn't know what it was gonna be and then I just saw the opening titles and I realized it, it kind of brilliantly summed it up. It was that epic song that kind of summed up what everyone was thinking about at the time and it sort of captured the aesthetics of the movie which is um, this uh, complete realism set in this um, timeless space, if that makes sense. Yeah. I guess it doesn't make a lot of sense because, I mean, you, yeah, like you say, you got this almost um, antique kind of play, classic tree, and, um, but at the same time, you got that chick from Soul Train dancing to it. Yes, and uh, actually the chick from The View, <laughs> which is amazing. Talk about a career path. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, 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 just, it just captured everything. I, you left the theater after you saw that movie with such this incredible visceral feeling um, I just I can remember everything about the first screening of, of seeing that film and how important it was. You know, with, Spike is just great at, he, he's able to put a stylistic um, spin on everything, yet also make everything emotionally true and real. So he was able to capture all that pain that was going on, um, but also have this humor and sort of playfulness that comes out of his, you know, m mischievous style. Yeah, and seeing that this is also about music today, um, especially at that time, you always had this thing where you had very current and hot music, and then um, you would have the Branford Masala's horn in the, 
in there you would have the score that was written by his father and right. so a lot of young hip-hop kids got actually introduced into that era of jazz. That's really interesting is, is trying to take music that is contemporary and mix it with a score. I mean I've only, I've, I've thought about that, doing that many many times because so much uh, music that I grew up with, I have so much connection to it. The one movie where I actually used songs was The Wrestler and um, I had absolutely no con connection to hair uh, metal music. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and it, that actually, we'll talk about in a little bit, was a very, very difficult thing to score. Um, but anyway, we should probably move forward. Um, yeah, we are a little bit pressed for time, but I yeah. still want to hear, because um, when I actually saw Pi for the first time, I, and that's why I was really curious of your relation to Spike Lee, because it reminded me a lot about uh, she's got to have it in a way. Sure. Well, I think I always sort of had a taste for the alternative or different. I was lucky to get the tail end of the 70s, so I did get something like Cyanide Fever, which became this phenomenon, but was definitely an underground <coughs> film and probably is more connect connected in some ways to Taxi Driver than it is connected to E.T. Uh, because that was sort of what came next, was the Star Wars, E.T., Jaws, which was a great time to grow up around movies as a kid. Um, but my taste, I think, was always for just alternative things. I don't know why. And one time we went, there's one shopping mall in Brooklyn called King's Plaza. It's not really a mall, but it had a multiplex. And we went, and um, I think Rocky Three or something was sold out. And uh, there was this poster, and there was a goofy guy with the word Brooklyn on his hat. And I was like, oh, let's go see that. And it was, we walked into the theater. It had, we were about 10 minutes late. And uh, it was, she's got to have it. And it was that kind of uh, montage sequence where all the different guys are doing pickup lines to Nola Darling about their, their privates and stuff. And... Um, I just sat there and I was like, what the fuck is this? I had never seen anything like that before in a, in a th cinema. And that sort of was the beginning for me of getting exposed to independent film and the idea that there was another way to tell stories. But then I started just sort of exploring it, but it was still very early when that was happening. There wasn't that much going on. There weren't that many people making films like that. But I think the bigger influence was probably things that were playing at this theater on West 8th Street in, um, in Manhattan. I forget the name of the movie theater. Does anyone know it? It's above the Jimi Hendrix Electric Lady. I think it was called the Astor Place Theater. I don't know. It's weird to ask Toronto people that. But they used to, um, they used to do uh, late night showings of um, Rocky Horror Picture Show, and they would do a bunch of the other movies like, that we're going to look at. Clockwork Orange, which we're not going to look at, would play there. And so I think my dream was always to be a film like that, to be a midnight movie. Um, I th that was the first aesthetic that I thought was really super cool. And um, there's another long, funny story, but we'll have to tell it another time about when we had it. My, first, my dream was always to have a film play at midnight in Manhattan, and when Pi did, it turned into a disaster, but it's for another time. We are always up for a good disaster story, but maybe we'll save that for later. But um, since we were going to talk about music and film, I wanted to definitely choose a piece from my favorite musical. And it was really hard because every number in this musical is incredible, and they're all perfect. And I'm not sh I, I think I chose this one because my nine-year-old likes it the most. Um, but anyway, we should roll it. <laughs> No one expected me to pick that one, did you? <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, that is as good as filmmaking gets. Everything's perfect. A and it's also, it's interesting because it's related to the first two in a lot of ways. And when you think about that, you can really think of Saturday Night Fever as a musical and even do the right thing very much as a musical. Um, and then, of course, this is, a, is a very clearly a musical. But I, I love that the sets are so realistic, and there's such a strive for this realism, even though they're dancing and singing. And sort of, once again, that 
this kind of anchor of realism mixed with this fantastical is so, and, and such, and they're all portrayals of New York City, is something I'm just very, very attracted to and has definitely been a big influence. But I look at that and every single shot, the camera is in exactly the right place. Um, as far as capturing the choreography, telling the story, uh, including the right characters at the right time. From the opening shot, you can see the bars over to the side that they're gonna end up, you know, for the final verse to stick them behind. So the director is already thinking about where the entire number is going to go. It's just, uh, the, the, that entire film is as good as it gets with, with camera work and everyone coming together, choreography and all the departments. At the time, I guess that was about grade eight, they made us read that to learn proper English. And West Side Story or Romeo yeah. and Juliet? Yeah, but uh, no, West Side Story oh, wow. in, uh, in music lessons, actually. And um, I was kind of perplexed at the time that New York street lingo w hadn't actually changed that much. Because <laughs> that was about the time that Satsasana came out, and all of a sudden you got a guy in, in West Side Story, which is clearly parents' music, yeah. um, talking to Daddy O. Yeah, yeah. Like one guy in Stetsasonic, and you're like, what on earth is going on here? I thought yeah. this was like the cool hip language. Yeah. Like, well, I think they, you know, the words come back, but I don't, not, I, I don't know what the final word is, Officer Krumpke. Krupp you? Krupp you, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, that's how they got away with it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. love it. Um, <clears throat> did you ever see, I mean, I presume you did, that really fantastic documentary they did with, um, around um, the Jose Carreras um, kind of version of, yeah. um, this is really fantastic documentary, I guess it's late 70s, early 80s, and it's about um, a recording, I presume, of West Side Story with him in the cast, and I wanna say Montserrat Cavalier, but don't crucify me if it isn't, and you really see New York at the time and the creative class, yeah. and there's one of the greatest moments ever about artistic outrage in there when, um, the union master comes in and tells um, everyone, look, time's over, rehearsal is over, mm. and Carreras was late, and he didn't get his ice cream in time, and so on. And so just about when he gets started, union comes in, shuts the thing down, and he just takes his sheet music and puts it into this really lovely leather pouch with a and there was just like probably there was this one second that's always would stick with West that story in a way. It's like of like what it must be like working with act actors, artists of a great caliber. And I guess you know one or two things about that. Um, I don't know anything about actors coming late to set. <laughs> or I dropping can, out I hear for my producer reason. Scott laughing somewhere in the audience. Um, I mean, I don't know, I, yeah, that would be a very different subject matter. <laughs> but, but I guess they usually try to come on time because usually it tends, working with you usually tends to get them an award yeah. nomination or so too. And like. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that kind of helps, I presume. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which is the segue to the next one. Is it? Well, I, I chose that. I don't know why, you don't know why I chose this one. You were all confused by this one. Yeah. But this was, this was a movie that I can remember. Um, I don't know if I should say this. Um, so. No, I'm not going to say it. No. Uh, any, but any, I can anyone, remember. Anyone I, says, I don't know, it's usually a good thing to say. I can remember seeing this, in the, watching this from the balcony of the Waverly Theater, which is now the IFC Theater in Manhattan. And uh, this was what, Th this was one of those films that inspired me to become a filmmaker, without a doubt. Um, so, and I just chose a very special moment for me, which kind of blew my mind on what a concert film could be. Yeah, Jonathan Demme, stop making sense. Um, I don't know, I mean, I guess, it's in, first, one of the cool things about that concert is you never see the fans. Uh, which is a very rare thing. It's always, uh, they always have the cutaways to the fans and it immediately dates every concert film out there, which sometimes can be really cool, as in Woodstock, and other times can be, I can't think of a humiliating one, but I'm sure there's many of them. But um, uh, 
and I, and I imagine what that was was um, I don't really know the history of it too much. I ha haven't researched it, but I imagine that was the Talking Heads concert that those RISD kids came up with, and and the idea of um, starting with an empty stage and then slowly building to a full concert, uh, it just blew my mind, the, the conceptual idea of that. Because if you remember, he comes out the opening scene with a boom box and sets it down, and it's com the back, you see the back of the stage, and it's just a bare stage with him and a microphone and an acoustic guitar. And by the end, you have these huge uh, numbers with a, I don't know, 15, 20 piece band, backup singers, and full, fully electrical. And for the audience, you know, you just, you're slowly getting the gimmick as the concert goes on. It's just, first it's David Byrne, then Tina Weymouth comes out and they <laughs> sing that. And then uh, I think the next song you get, um, you get the drummer, I don't really remember. But um, uh, I, it just was such a bizarre idea. And then the way Demi decided to shoot it and how he captured it was perfect because he's hinting at it you don't really get it, but that one shot that's right at the beginning when he's o shooting over the tech hands as they're setting up Tina um, is just, uh, it's just a brilliant way to slowly tell the story and slowly reveal what's going on. That, that for me, I think, is the great thing is when the camera is pushing the story forward so, so well w and working so well with the music. Yeah, apart from the fact that Tina Weymouth gets her shine, which is really great because she's probably one of the most underrated musicians of the 20th century, um, is the moment just before that scene when he comes in and um, puts on a cassette and starts a drum track alone, which is pretty lethal drum track. And um, it's actually the second out of four clips where a drum a cassette plays a crucial role, and I believe there's a third one later as well. Mm. And um, it's kind of interesting how that kind of gets lost because, I mean, what are you going to show now? Like someone yeah, dialing exactly. for a file? Exactly. I mean, you would just move your iPhone around, but people wouldn't know if you were just checking your text messages or what. Uh, hold on, I got to put a drum beat on here for a second. Um, yeah? Yeah, Psycho Killer, I can say. Um, can we go to the next one, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we. We should probably talk a little bit about um, uh, stuff I've done with Clint a little bit. Who's this Clint character? Clint Mansell is the composer who's done the last, um, well, the, my, la my, all my feature films. Um, you all know Clint, right? Yeah. <coughs> so Clint, um, you know, the, when we were working on, Requiem was an interesting step up, you know, because on Pi, I, he just reminded me uh, about this story. I guess it started off with a single track I asked him to write, which was sort of the theme music for the Pi Man. Um, and he came in with this track and it was so good. And then it, as we moved further and further along on making the film, he, we just saw other places where he could create music for us, and he just kept supplying great music for us. Then when we got to Requiem, it was very important to me to, uh, to treat the composer like I would treat the DP or the production designer or the editor. They're an equal partner, I think, and I've always come from that philosophy that the uh, composer is one of those major collaborators. So Clint, would always get the script at the very beginning of the process and uh, conversations would continue and sometimes after he would read the script he would put together a small and back then it was a mixtape of some of his ideas that he probably recorded on some electronic device and then when we were into the editing of the movie he kind of hit a wall a little bit because I, I, it was sort of like I don't think he really knew where to begin so uh, he was living down in New Orleans then, I flew down, and um, the sort of major piece of Requiem for a Dream was this little tiny phrase that was in, this, in the middle of this mixtape. And we just list, listened through the mixtape, and, and we heard that part, and then 
we recognized that something interesting was going on there and we queued it up with different parts of the image and it worked really well. And that I think gave um, Clint the first sort of stepping stone of, of how to begin to sort of make the, the score that it became. So we should probably just watch that clip. And that's the Verrazano Bridge, that's the same bridge. <laughs> Sorry. That's the same bridge as in the opening of um, Sinai Fever. See the hermeneutics unfolding here in front of your <laughs> exactly. eyes. Exactly, patterns are everywhere. That's from Pi. Um, so uh, it's funny, that, I mean that's only a little piece of what became Lux Eterna, which then eventually uh, ended up on Peter Jackson's trailers and then, I don't know, now it's during the Rose Bowl parade and <laughs> when the Knicks take center court. Um, it's strange when that happens, when, you know, uh, and it was almost a, mic it was almost a lost clip uh, on this mixtape that Clint, you know, just was, after reading the script, was inspired to write. Um, so it was interesting how we did that. We basically said, okay, this is going to be our main kind of requiem or this, our main tune. And then we chose the different places in the film and we almost color coded it. In fact, we may have color coded it and said, okay, we're going to use this over in different places uh, in the film to sort of emphasize a certain thing. And then we sort of looked at the different um, characters and tried to create themes and ideas to connect them. And so Clint would see all the narrative underpinnings of the script and the story and sort of try to match up his music along with that. And I, that's part of the reason I think we've had a good success between me and him is because he's very interested in story and understands story and can see how those uh, different things connect. The reason I let that clip go on um, was interesting because when we first got that piece of music, that um, dun, 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 that kind of crazy frenetic thing that plays throughout the third act of Requiem for a Dream, um, I gave, I bought, <laughs> went to the bargain, the bargain, you remember how they used to have like in the record stores like bargain bins? So I went and I bought all the requiems from Mozart and from Bach and Brahms because it was always filled with classical, you know, so you could buy them all for 99 cents. It was probably just beginning DVDs. And I gave Clint all the requiems of the great classical musicians and I said, just sample it and turn it into something. And that's what that is. That's actually, um, it, it might be the Kronos Quartet playing over it. In fact, I know it is but it started off with Clint taking, illegally taking samples <laughs> um, and mixing them around and distorting them, which then I guess maybe makes that, that legal at that point, if it's distorted enough. And then the Kronos is over it. it was, one little story about the Kronos in that, which is this great quartet, which we collaborated with on this film and The Fountain and on Noah, is, uh, because Clint was working electronically, and I don't even think, back then, I'm not sure it was as sophisticated as Pro Tools, and like things could be not quite in time very easily. And it was interesting to watch them kind of debate if it was 132s or 164s, and they could actually hear the difference between a 132 and a 164, which is kind of hard, right, for all the musicians? I don't know, maybe not. I don't know, for me, I was impressed. Um, but we, we, we looked at that entire film as a requiem because requiem is a musical term. So there's probably music wall to wall throughout that film and it starts in the opening sequence when Harry is stealing the um, TV. It's, a, it's the Kronos warming up and I was actually conducting them on how intense their warming up should be. And then when the card hits and the film begins is um, sort of when the Requiem actually begins. Well, um, we... <laughs> we had Public Enemy in a different clip beforehand and do the right thing. Um, you were actually thinking of using Public Enemy in this one as well, the rumor goes. Yeah, I forgot that story until I read it. Um, but I think uh, I've always, you know, hip hop was such a big influence I was uh, 15 or 16 when um, 
the, when hip hop first got onto the radio in New York, and, on, and it was only on Friday and Saturday nights that they would play hip hop, which is a crazy thing, but that was the only time that they played hip hop on radio. And if, so Friday and Saturday night was the biggest thing in the world. You would drive around with your friends and depending on if you, which borough you lived on, you either listened to 98.7 or 107.5 and both radio stations would be insulting each other about how cool, how cool Brooklyn and Staten Island was and versus Manhattan and the Bronx. No one really talked about Queens except for Run DMC. Um, and uh, it was an amazing time in music, so I think when I started to do film, I always wanted to sort of do something with uh, you know, that passion I had as a teenager, because that's often those early teenager, those, that teenage music, it's funny because there's a big debate about what popular music is with me and my son who's like, the Beatles were pop music, and I'm like, you're kind of right, they kind of were, but how do you define pop music? It is popular. Popular, right. So the Beatles would be pop, would, would Kurt Cobain be pop so. music? I would say so. Really? Okay, well he, that's, there you go. So I guess maybe I like pop music. Um, I'd like to take a very Warhol-esque stone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in pop music and hip hop in particular, sampling is obviously a big thing. You said yourself how you um, kind of drove Clint to start from classical to end up where he was. And um, obviously as any creative, trying to emulate things that you really admire is always a big um, leeway to get you to a different place. And would you believe it? It works visually as well, which would kind of lead us to the next clip, I presume. Which is what? Oh, yeah. Well, this is, um, I don't know, what was your connection to it? Um, I would call that sampling, or the segue to sampling. It's, okay. Um, how I would connect them is, what, 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 the, re the connection I was trying to make was, um, I think there's something about when music kicks in and how music, when it kicks in, can incredibly t change a story. So I decided to choose a few uh, examples of that, because definitely in Requiem after she has that horror moment um, where the fridge tries to eat her and then it kicks in with Lux Eterna, um, I imagine I was channeling some of my favorite films. So this would be a perfect example of it. This is Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa. Talk about badass motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only the beginning. I mean, that's about as good as that once, for me, that, that's, you know, next to West Side Story, that's also as good as it gets. Um, it's just, it's perfection. I, it's interesting to see, I grew up watching that on a VHS tape, and I never, it was always kind of blurry, and I never realized that the tattoo was a, he has like a tattoo of a die. It's like a number six and number one. I don't know, it was a weird tattoo, I thought. I never noticed it before. Um, but I just love, I mean, how the music kicks in and says this is, um, it's, it's just such a great exclamation point on the scene. He even plays with sound design so well, um, Kurosawa, in bringing down the sound of the, the wind and the leaves for a second right before the line of dialogue. And I imagine, I wonder, I, I don't know how, why he brings it up again right before he says the line, coffin maker to make two. I'm wondering if he was using the sound that was on set and he didn't loop it, but it almost feels like um, there's a reason for it. And I never noticed as distinctly as here, so I have to look at it closer, but it's, um, it's just a great moment. He's just pulling everyone in to this shocking moment then gives the character a joke, which is what the character is, and then, and then kicks in with that awesome beat. I mean, scholars are always on about how Kurosawa is all about um, these little gestures that he assigns to a character. And I guess you're doing, trying to do a similar thing sonically as well. Like, uh, you would recognize certain themes with characters throughout the movies, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with different levels of timings and multiverses and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you try to use music and sound design both as ways to push character. We often would talk about different themes for different characters all the time, and, and then that even relates to, um, to sound design. Definitely, I mean, in Requiem for a Dream, 
there was a whole, there was tons of sound design about what her apartment would sound like and how those different sounds in the apartment had their own life and became completely subjective with her insanity. But we should go into the next clip, which is kind of the exact, does the same exact thing as what Kurosawa does. It's just by another great master, Sergio Leone, and this is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Who kind of sampled this, the movie we just sure. saw as well? Yeah, I was so clearly good. influenced by it, yeah. yeah. That's so good. Uh, you know, I, I'm choosing all the best, and then I'm putting my crappy shit up next to it. Um, <laughs> So that's, uh, that's the bomb, that's like, uh, so if, right before that, uh, you know, the beginning of the film, yeah, Blondie, Clint Eastwood abandons the ugly and almost kills him, and then the ugly gets him back and almost kills him, and then they both find out that there's a treasure and they need each other, and uh, they recover at that church. Uh, and so the last time we saw them, they were basically just using each other at enemies, but by the end of this moment, there it's this new chapter where they are fully partners, and they recognize there's this new brotherhood that has come out of it, and everything is working to that from the performance of Clint Eastwood, rec you know, having witnessed what really went on between the brothers and willing to rise above it because he recognizes what's ahead of them, um, and the ugly doesn't realize he's being manipulated but is able in his sort of uh, id state to let go of that pain and, and move forward and take the cigar and take this moment of charity from a new friend almost. And, uh, and then when he lets that go and there's that great moment by the great Eli Wallach where he lets go of the pain, wraps himself in his poncho and takes a breath towards forward and Morricone kicks in with the greatest, maybe the greatest melody ever written for film music. And, um, and that's in a film that has at least four other top 50 world hits in like, it. Right? Like, exactly. I mean, the one for the Mexican standoff scene, yeah, 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 yeah. the main theme song yeah. as well, and the one that Metallica abuse all the time. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I never caught that. Um, so anyway, that that uh, that for me is uh, is is the greatest of filmmaking. Once again, that same idea of using music to enter a new chapter uh, by going back to the main refrain, which I didn't actually realize I was doing till right this moment here on the stage. Um, but I think that's what it is. It's like uh, in the moment with Toshiro Mifune, he's suddenly okay he set the stage that he is the badass in town and the most valuable chess piece on the board. And, um, and now, now it's all about how that chess piece is gonna be moved. Um, and uh, in this moment, it's that, that final chapter. I mean, that, this, it, this film, you know, Leone more, as much as anyone, is, it makes opera, I think. And there's that great scene later on when the ugly is searching for the tombstone and it's running around and the camera is spinning, chasing him. And you're no longer, it's no longer just cinema. It's become something else where it is uh, operatic. And don't you find it kind of tragic that the person who on the musical side was responsible for that um, and composed all that still doesn't really want to talk about it or perf even perform it because he feels like he has failed as a classical composer. I, I saw him play a Radio City musical I mean, with a hundred people. He just about in the last years came around yeah. to it, but for years he uh, was just Well, like, he got there know. before he died, so he's all right, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, I, he, and definitely when he played Radio City, New York went crazy for him. It was amazing. It was an amazing concert. I don't know if he's still doing it, but... I, I just heard he's, uh, you know, he's scoring Quentin Tarantino's Western, which is going to be awesome. So that's really cool. So back to Japan. We can talk about sound design because that's how we go into this, which is another interesting thing about that that he does is as they're pulling away from the church is that is the church bell. Everybody hear that church bell going off, which is a great, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost the same way that um, Kurosawa was using the sound of the leaves. You know, suddenly the sound design and the setting returns you to the reality where you are. And I imagine if, um, 
you know, you have to remember he was, I don't even know if, if Sergio Leone was working in stereo. Would you know? It's probably, what, what? I guess it depends on which phase. What do you mean which phase? Like what time of the recording? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm asking. I, I don't know, he might have been just working mono. So there was no way for him to like throw that church bell into the back speakers and have it slowly disappear, which is kind of what he's hinting at is as they're pulling away, the bell of the church is ringing and they're leaving it, but it also is like a, a you know, uh, it's a count to start the music. Um, and that's for me something that's always been something I've really been interested in is bringing the sound designer and the composer as close together. And when we did our first three or four films, the main sound designer um, would give Clint lots of his sounds sometimes electronically and, and vice versa so that we could um, sort of blend them into one sort of soundscape as much as possible. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, there's many, many great examples of how to use sound design. And the one that I wanted to, I did want, every once in a while I like to do a little homage and um, you just get totally inspired by the themes of another movie and how they're connected to yours. Sampling. You sample, it's, it's, it's a form of sampling. And, um, and I think, that I, you know, I'm a big, big fan of sampling. It's one of my favorite musical forms. But I think you gotta make it your own, you know, and that's always the line when you're just stealing and then when you turn it into something else. Spike Lee did a great one. Um, I think it's in Mo Better Blues when he's crossing the street and the taxi cab almost hits him and he's like, I'm walking here and stole it from Urban Cowboy. Um, and, but, um, so this is a, a, a really amazing use of sound design by, um, by Kurosawa again. It's in a film called Ikuru to Live. And it's, the, the setup is this man is just finding out that, well, he's, not, he's figuring it out that he has terminal cancer. And then this is uh, my sample of it. Uh, this is after uh, Tommy in the fountain finds out that his wife is dying. So. Yeah, uh, he, uh, Kurosawa had a bigger crane. <laughs> uh, I just realized we could have gone further out. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was just very, I, I, you know, of course, to live we watched, and there were many films we watched that dealt with mortality, and um, so, that was, a big, that was a big influence and I decided to give it a shout out in, in the filmmaking. But I love the idea of uh, what Kurosawa came up with, this idea that you, you're so lost in your own head that you're completely cut off from the environment. And then, and I guess almost everyone has experienced that at one stage in their yeah. life or other, that how your inner and your outer world sometimes just don't, don't connect. correspond. Yeah. And I, you know, all the visual cues he used in the background from the um, welding arc, it was just brilliant because this, everything deserves noise and he doesn't. And I, you know, Kurosawa went directly to um, no noise. So there's actually nothing in the soundtrack there. He went completely silent. And I wanted to do the same and the studio couldn't, they wouldn't allow us to do it because in deliverables, the, the uh, somewhere far and might get really confused about what that is and think there's a mistake and then they won't get paid. <laughs> so I had a, I was forced to do that footstep thing and it still kind of kills me that it's there. Um, but you, you're not allowed to have an empty soundtrack in and You could have just put picture. like a really annoying frequency somewhere yeah, yeah, that's just like, yeah. yeah, but they would have been upset with that too. They would, it would have been caught technically and they, everyone would have complained about it. Not that it was distributed internationally, The Fountain, but <laughs> there had been. Well, it, it made it to like a 40-seater in Cologne. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Oh, did it get to, it played in the theater in Cologne? Yeah. No, it didn't. No, it did. Really? Yeah, like it like, was a 40 or 50-seater, I want to say. That's okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, people, but, uh, are, people are connecting now. Uh, 
20 yeah, years later? I was going to say, I think it was probably everyone that bought the comic book as well was in there. OK, yeah. good. That was one showing. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> when you, how do you deal with, with the sounds you got in your head when you're actually writing the comic books? Well, the comic books are really, uh, the comic books, I don't, I don't, I'm not a comic book writer. I, I admire graphic novels a lot, and I think it's a great art form. Um, Los Bros Hernandez and uh, Mobius, I mean, there's so many influences that I, when I was uh, maybe in my early 20s that I really got into that stuff. But um, I came up with the idea to do a fountain comic book because the film got shut down and looked like it was never going to happen, and I really wanted to get the story into the world because I had worked on it for years and years. So we found an artist and figured out a way to bring it, to put it out there. And then we did the same thing with Noah when it looked like that was going to be an impossible film to make. So usually if I'm doing a comic book, it's, it's a, you know, something that I think is not going to happen and it's an act of depression, not sure. an act of joy. You should probably stop it. It might be bad <laughs> omen. Like yeah. that con it's, fun, it's fun though. It's fun to see. And, and those comic books are completely different than the actual movies because I really wanted to choose an artist and give them free reign to create their own thing. And I guess some of the stories are easier to tell in that format because uh, avid readers, uh, comic book readers, are really used to multiverses mm. at, at any given time. It's just like, okay, now we go to this yeah, different exactly. galaxy. Yeah, exactly. It did fit very well. It, it yeah. fit very well into that world. Um, I think you know one of the early things about the structure was influenced by comic books. So yeah, it made total sense to go back to it. Um, I guess we're going to a different yeah, universe. Yeah, where are now. we? Oh, yeah. So we, uh, I don't know how, I have no bridge here. Take it to the bridge, guy. It, no. it, it is uh, a different is universe. It's yeah. a parallel world. I get, we talked about it a little earlier, but uh, the only film I did that doesn't really have a score is The Wrestler. And uh, par partly because we couldn't afford one, uh, but that wasn't really the reason. <coughs> It was clear when we were doing The Wrestler that with that character, uh, Rob Siegel, the writer, made it very, it was in the, in the screenplay, uh, so much of the hair, hair metal music. Is that what you call that metal? Pop metal music? I don't know. Hair, hair pop metal music? It depends on whether you ask the people that listen to it or others that describe <laughs> it. I think there's a massive An outside difference. scholar, yeah. if you had... If you had rat, lot, if you had rats sitting here, or except, oh, what would you say their genre is? Epic. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't very familiar with epic music um, when I started The Wrestler. Um, I got a lot of uh, mixtapes, and I started to listen to that stuff, and uh, it all fit great. It was it was a lot of fun because we had to find songs. We had very very little budget, and we ha we needed a lot of music, so. Um, we, it, was, uh, it, it was just a very, very long process. And, but I realized without that, we were not in danger of being a documentary, but we definitely wanted to give the audience a sense that they were watching a movie. And we also thought that maybe there was a way to sort of give a sense of mood um, by introducing a score. And I think it was actually probably one of the more difficult projects for Clint, even though there was only eight to ten minutes of music in the entire film from him. Uh, and that's because the music, um, if it got too sappy, it immediately got really sappy, the movie. And if it went the other direction, it, it just was very easy to tip this balancing act of reality we were trying to create. But eventually Clint stumbled on something that I thought was very atmospheric and really um, did the job, right? So, I guess it's a little foreboding. If you had to put, what adjective would you use for it? Foreboding, no? Okay. Um, anyone here? Um, but, it, it, you know, it, it's just, it was just a very simple thing that's Slash playing that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think it just did the mood, and we only used it for like eight minutes in the film. Um, who's on your funding committee, or what's it with the pill popping always? 
I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just weirdly occurred to me, yes. Is there a lot of pill popping in my films? I don't know. I, you, Noah wasn't pill popping. <laughs> well, you should think about that. <laughs> At um, least on screen. Yeah. <laughs> Just joking. Very bad joke. Very bad joke. Um, but still, uh, um, when you think of the next scene in, in that movie, the juxtaposition in sound as well, like when he starts fighting with the kids in this playful yeah. way, and it moves to something different, and at the same time, the way the sound is, general soundtrack is used, and then you got... There's the no soundtrack in that, is it? It's just them playing. No, I mean, uh, later on, but yeah. uh, when you got things like the stapler, yeah. Um, that is painful. I mean, it sounds painful. Yeah, you're just yeah, yeah. every time you're like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, sound design was a big part of it. Um, it was interesting. It was uh, the, the, my favorite story from that is, uh, you know, we could only afford, as I was saying, these these we were paying five thousand dollars a song, which isn't that amount uh, that much. Amount I will of money. use that in future negotiations. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And. Um, the only song we could get is that, you know, there's a scene where Mickey and Marissa go to a bar and have a drink, and Round and Round by Rat comes on the radio, and they start singing along. We were able to get that because the band Rat <coughs> re-recorded it, so they, it wasn't the actual original masters, it was their new masters. Uh, that was a way a lot of bands, I think, got around, the, you know, licensing, so they got some of the money. Um, and uh, the whole day, Mickey's like, there's no way I'm doing that song. There's no way. Get me Sweet Child of Mine. So the last time Sweet Child of Mine was given was when Guns N' Roses was a band, and I think they paid $2 million to have someone oh, sing it. was only one it. album ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they, uh, so, so I was like, Mickey, we're not getting it. He's like, I'm going to talk to... I'm going to talk to Axel. It's not going to be a problem. I was like, all right, feel free, talk to Axel. Go for it. <clears throat> so he calls up Axel, who I think, you know, I, I don't know, they had some type of connection. And um, <laughs> it's not happening, you know, Axel won't talk to Slash, Slash won't talk to Axel, whatever was going on. Uh, and I'm like, Mickey, we got to do the round and round. And he's like, all right, shoot Marissa's side first. So we shoot Marissa, she's great. And then we have to turn the cam it's after lunch, we have to turn the cameras around, and Scott, my producer, comes up to me, he's like, we got Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> but we had shot out Marissa already, and I was like, I was like um, he's like, do we tell Mickey? And I was like, ah, fuck. <laughs> what do we do? And, and, and what happened is, I think, I don't know why they just decided, it, and, and I guess we decided not to tell Mickey, but Mickey already knew, of course, because Axel called him. And he was like, I understand that he was, Mickey was big of heart, and he was like, uh, I'll do the other side because we're already halfway done. Um, and we ended up then using Sweet Child of Mine for the really great moment in the film when he enters the ring for the final fight. Uh, but it was funny because the deal we had, he had to actually be singing along with it, which is, so there's this one moment where Mickey is mouthing the words and, uh, <laughs> So I was singing along with it, and that's how we got around it. Um, but thank you, Axel and Slash and everyone at Guns N' Roses for that one. Yes, yeah, sadly, we omitted the scene you were just talking about, the bar scene, because uh, I felt there was clearly a post Catherine Dayak Sopranos kind of scene in the way that the lyrics in the soundtrack are part of the story. and take you to the inner monologue of what's going on with the character when I think the red thing ends on something like shoot, shoot an arrow through my heart or something yeah. like that? I actually never learned the words either, so I don't know what they but were. It really <laughs> works in that moment. <laughs> Does it? Like, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but it was, it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was probably one of the hardest days of shooting on that, on that film. It was a very tough day. Um, the next piece we were going to do... Hang on, there's one more question oh, yeah, on that sure. scene, because uh, something we always wondered uh, as kids, um, what is it with the white American male and dancing towards the end of a movie? Like, there is always... If you don't have a car chase, you need to have an awkward wh white male dance there. And that clearly... What are you talking about? Oh, 
think you rock your stance dancing in yeah, that Yeah, but where else, what other movie has that? Countless. Like this. Give me like two. <laughs> Weird, hold on, you're saying instead of a big fight at the end, they have a, they have a guy like dance? Like a dance scene where people are doing at least something like this. Um, yeah. We get to that later. We'll save that for the after party. Does anyone know what he's talking about? <laughs> Anybody? No? Um, I mean, Patrick Swayze or something in one of those movies? I don't know. Um, Footloose, maybe? That's two, but the, that's kind of what they're about. Um, <laughs> I guess they could have put a fight scene at the end of Footloose. Uh, using singing along with music. No dancing, though. No dancing was, um, was what inspired this next clip, um, which is the, uh, the very end of Full Metal Jacket by uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, I don't know, we should just, we, we should, uh, it, it's the very end of the movie. Joker, Matthew Modine's character, has just um, killed um, this female sniper. And it just, let's watch it and then we'll talk about it. Um, that is so good, also. <laughs> Everything's good that we showed tonight. But um, for me, that it, I, there's so many things that that film is about. Uh, it's hard to, but one of the things that it might be about is, you know, as you remember, it's kind of split in two. There's the first half in training camp, and then the second half is in Vietnam. Uh, and the first half is all about order. This, this is the way I see it. It's all about perfect order, and it's about turning these human beings into machines, but there's this one uh, piece of chaos, which is this overweight soldier who just is slowly picked on until he eventually uh, explodes and can't handle it and uh, explodes his brains against the wall. Um, and, then they, and then it's all about bringing these machines and this order into chaos. And suddenly it, the whole shooting style changes and the whole entire film is a completely different movie. And I think that final shot is all about taking the grid of that order and sticking it over that chaos while they're in this complete um, they're, they're in hell, literally, of just a destroyed landscape, yet they're perfectly ordered in a grid, singing the great theme song of America, trying to stamp this grid across chaos. And it's sort of in one image, not just an image, an idea through music it completely sells the whole point of the film. That's my theory on that. It's not bad, right? Yeah, it's kind of I'd nice. buy that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, um, I don't know what is a similar expression in English. In German, you would call it uh, the singing in the forest. When you're a little kid and you go into the dark forest and right. you're trying to sing whatever sticks in your mind so that you don't have to feel scared about the right. ghosts. But he so. literally says in this, I'm not scared. Yeah. Um, he points that out. So he's, he might, knowing Kubrick, he was thinking about that. He knew the German interpretation and wanted to answer it and say, you're wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. But it, that's, that's, that's a big part of it. They're not afraid. They're completely loose and free like children, but they're that perfect killing machine um, going across that, that world of hell. But then again, if you're saying you're scared, then there's a good chance Right. You're shit scared. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, this also sparked off a really bizarre phenomenon. Um, the song from the first half, the I Would Want to Be a Trill Instructor, um, had a dance remix and became a dance hit around the world, which looked a bit weird in a discotheque, because uh, it had like a funk sort of drum beat. Which, and which line did they use? The entire song. Oh, this, the, the, I want to be your trill instructor. And I want to, like the entire chant. Oh, really? Yeah. I and it was it. like a number one song. Oh, there you go. And um, that was a bit disturbing seeing <laughs> that. I'm like, Especially when you see in the film. But it was also at the height of the Cold War, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Service, so to speak, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now for something mildly different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know why, look, I chose this, I, I wanted to do one more musical, which isn't really a musical either. Uh, 
but uh, it's a film I only really got exposed to after being a filmmaker already and people saying, have you ever seen that? And I think I did see it, I did see part of it as a kid, but I think in this case, when I did see it, my mom pulled me out of the theater because she realized it wasn't appropriate. Um, and that's All That Jazz by Bob Fosse. And I'm including the clip because it's a moment to brag, which was, he shot it at SUNY Purchase in this black theater, and the film, the next film after that shot there was actually Black Swan, mm -hmm. that that theater had been dormant from film production, and that was one of the major reasons I chose to be in the space. I was like, oh, this has got good vibes. We've got to shoot it. So this, this scene is, uh, that we're going to watch a little bit of is uh, shot in the same space where um, the, they're, all the ballerinas are practicing and... Uh, the uh, Tomas, the head of uh, Vincent Cassell character, sort of t pitches that there's going to be a new white swan. And this is the closing of All That Jazz by Bob Fosse. But I guess you need to give a little bit of context where that scene kicks in, because it might be a bit misleading from where we cued it. Like, what right. happens in the last 10 minutes before that? Well, he's dead, so this is his, like, uh, I don't know what it, I mean, it's completely abstract, but it's sort of his final, I think it's his, it's his moments of death, and it's kind of been turned into a big musical number. It's really out of context. <laughs> uh, but I, everyone, I mean, he's, uh, He's really forgotten as far as how amazing of a filmmaker he is, Bob Fosse. And um, that's, that's kind of the climax of his masterpiece. And I definitely wanted to use a clip of it, but it's really, if you haven't seen the film, it's introducing all the characters of his life that he's saying goodbye to as he dies. Yeah, sadly, it's not available on the usual kind of platforms. So in order to watch it, you get every malware on the planet. Oh, um, really? So, um, Is that true? It's not on, it's, it's, you can't, um, it's it, hard it to get. It was very tough to find, but the, sad, gladly the last 20 minutes or so in one block are on YouTube, and so are most of the key scenes. Oh, really? So, okay. um, so it's worth, actually, how they end up there is actually really we're, we're worth seeing. Um, so anyway, everyone should go out and see all that jazz. It's great. That's all I can say about it. Um, well, we started in New York and we kind of circle back to New York because I guess they really want to have us out of that building rather soon. But um, I guess we have to talk about um, one of the other films where you make a really gorgeous actress cry, like you seem to do. And um, this time we're entering the classical arena. You just hinted at it, um, Plex One. Yeah, well. I, Black Swan was also very much, in certain ways, a, uh, it's not a musical, but it's, uh, music was clearly a big part of it. And we looked at the entire film always as a retelling of Swan Lake. When we first, the, it started off, there was a screenplay that had, it was sort of based on the double, the Dostoevsky, the double, and I always liked that, I, that idea. I always thought it was a really scary idea that you wake up one day and someone's stealing your identity. So I was looking for something to do with that, and I was also looking at something to do set in the ballet world because my sister had been a ballerina and I had grown up around it. And while doing research for this, I ran into, I went to a production of Swan Lake and realized that there is this story of doubles in Swan Lake. There's a black swan and a white swan. And it was this kind of eureka moment. And then I always looked at the making of that movie very much as just a, a narrative filmmaking version of the ballet Swan Lake. So we, I even went as far as um, taking the whole ballet, listening to it over and over again, and assigning in order different pieces of music to each scene. Um, Matthew Bourne, who did the all-male um, Swan Lake, which was fantastic, came up to me afterwards and he was like, oh, you didn't have to put it in order. So it was like a great compliment to me that he picked up on that we did that. And, um, but the closing sequence was always very, very clear. And you know, the way Swan Lake ends, I knew exactly how Black Swan was gonna go. And I can remember that that was like the big pitch. Black Swan was yet another film that was incredibly difficult to make. I was actually with some here at TIFF last night with a, <laughs> a guy who 
decided not to invest in it, and he was just sort of crying into his drink last night about it. Still five years later, and I was sort of goading and making fun of him um, all night. So, uh, so this is the end of it, and it was, it was very clear when we first pitched the movie that this was exactly how we were gonna do it. We didn't know the exact moves, but I knew the music and I knew the narrative goal of where it was gonna go. So, the end of Black Swan. That was fun. I saw Natalie last night. She's here showing her film right now, her, the first film that she directed, uh, which is great. And uh, she was reminding me how we did that, um, which was the falling onto the mattress was, she's actually standing upright, and she's on a dolly, and the bed, the mattress is on a dolly, and they sort of both came at each other. <laughs> and right before she hit, I would say tuck, and she would do that, so she was not really hitting it. And that's how we did that, which is, it looks pretty good, the illusion. <laughs> it's good. Um, you know, just because how do you get the camera to follow with her? It, was, it took us a long time to figure that one out. Uh, anyway, I don't know. you have any questions or anything about that? <laughs> or did I answer it all? I always see this really nasty police rap sign oh, over there. Okay. And I don't think they're trying to tell us to do sandwiches or do rhymes, but... Um, <laughs> Like, yeah. Um, and the one thing that kind of struck me in there, are you ever thinking about um, the sonic characteristics that certain actors bring with them? Because, I mean, you're using her, who's been in some things that are, were sonically pretty um, striking, and you're also using Marcel Cassel, who's um, one of his major roles was in uh, Irreversible, or Irreversible, and um, the way they work with sound there is incredibly stunning. Mm -hmm. With that droney sound that Thomas Bangalter did for it. And um, I somehow felt in this one, like that character is somehow back. He just has a different job now. And, um, and you always seem to, like the way Clint deals with it, it's always like a part two, even though it's a totally different story, a different continent in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm sort of, uh, but uh, I didn't quite follow, you have to admit. Um, <laughs> but are you saying that the character, Vincent's character sort of is, uh, that we were sort of I mean, they're, they're, they're always like, the audience always, or sometimes has a tough time differentiating between the character yeah. and the actor, obviously. Right. And, so, and so they're always taking a bit, I mean, some folks are going like, oh, Princess and Leia is doing ballet yeah. now, so what's the story there? And um, how do you deal with that when you start designing the characters and mm. their... Well, you try to put, you know, I think it comes down to casting. You try to get the right actor to fill the role. And I think if people are thinking about other characters that that uh, person played, you're sort of, um, you know, that's a big problem. So it's, it's about making the character convincing enough that it overcomes and that you believe what you're watching. I think it's always an issue when you're dealing with um, celebrities. And that's why it's interesting, you know, celebrities that sort of shield their life and their personal life, it helps. And also a problem, you know, when you're trying to get someone from TV who gets so connected to a character, how do you break them away from the character that they played and turn them, you know, and some, some, character, some actors get devoured by those characters and that's who they are for the rest of their lives. And, you know, there's Mark Hamill and there's um, Harrison Ford. And so, it, I don't know, it could, it could be the, it could be the actor try, you know, being able to take on other characters or it could be the opportunities they choose. Um, you never know why that is. Do you find that is getting harder with the plethora of new content, especially serialized content out there now? I think so. I mean, I think a lot, you know, it's also, yeah, not just on TV, but of course in the superhero and all the franchise movies is that a lot of the great talent is being used in those places and it's hard to just get to work with a lot of the great actors because they're, you know, they're booked for the next um, five, six years. So 
That's the other issue with those big franchise movies. Um, as far as like you know what's happening on TV, it's it's really a great and exciting time because you get you're getting incredible risks being taken, and the stories that would never have anywhere else to be told being told. And with a lot of space. With a lot of space and a lot of room. Yeah. Well, space is a little bit confined today, but um, obviously we don't want to go out without showing an essential part of the fountain. But before we do that, because we will sneakily disappear during it. Okay. Um, I guess um, people want to hear A about Mokwai, but they also want to have a chance to thank you before they go out and grab some drinks. Okay. And um, so please join me in thanking Mr. Thank Arnowski you guys for, for being here. Thank you. So, Anyway, we, we're ending it. I think this is probably mine and Clint's uh, favorite thing we did together. So here it is, the end of the and fountain. Any words? Why? That's why, my what, words, man? baby. That's it. <laughs> Let's rock and roll.